Okay, everybody, welcome to the last session of today. It's going to be about device independence, contextuality, negativity. So to quote someone from before is the place to be. Uh, so now I'm going to let Pierre uh, talk about bigger negativity and contextuality are equivalent for continuous variable quantum measurements. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you for the organization of this very nice workshop. Uh, this is joint work with Robert and Ulysse, who are here at the conference, but uh, not here. Like the, I think they're on Zoom. Um, and so this project started because um, I was try trying to have a, an outline of PhD thesis, and I had two different blocks. And you know, when you're doing a PhD, you try to have a very nice story to tell. I was like, I can't find a nice story to tell. And so this is a missing chapter that would, uh, you know. Uh, make it look nice, basically. Uh, but this is also a project, uh, like a question we, we were wondering um, for some time. Um, before going into the details, just mentioning that uh, quickly after our paper, there is another uh, paper by Juani and, uh, and uh, Jonas, who essentially prove the same result. So um, the project is about uh, finding an equivalence between two notions of non-classicality. One is Wigner function. Um, maybe you're less familiar with that. So, uh, sorry, not Wigner negativity or negativity of the Wigner function. And the other one is uh, context rate in continuous variable. So first, I'll introduce uh, one of the notion, CV context rate. So um, maybe you're familiar with context rate. And I'll just give you a, a brief uh, background before getting into, into the details. So to give you an intuition, um, for contextuality, I really like this impossible figures that you can find in, uh, in work by Shane and, and Samson and, and co-authors. So basically, what happens with this impossible figure is that if you only look at it partially, um, so not the global picture, but partially, so avoid what's behind the, the, the orange box, then it makes sense, like it's consistent. And so everything is consistent when you only look locally. But if you have a look at the global picture, it becomes weird inconsistence or sometimes you, you, you can also find paradoxes and so um, contextuality arises whenever um, of course you have local consistency but you cannot find a global explanation so it cannot be explained globally and so for those more familiar with uh, non-locality you can draw the kind of same sets for non-local correlations where you have no non-contextual correlation then a bigger polytope which is node signaling or no disturbance polytope and then in the between uh, the quantum set which is a convex set Okay, so now to get into more detail uh, about contextuality, um, I'll be talking about the shift theoretic approach, uh, approach of the book by Samson and, uh, and Adam. Um, and you need two main ingredients. The first one is measurement scenario, and the second one is empirical mode. So a measurement scenario is just an abstract description of an experiment. So um, it needs three, three objects. Uh, first X, uh, a set, finite set of measurement scenario and when we go to the cv setting we we'll relax this to be um, an infinite set of measurement levels as a, to give you an example you can think about a bad experiment where you have alice and bob each has two observable a a prime for alice b b prime for bob and uh, this is your finite set of measurements but then you need a compatibility structure so that's m as a maximal context and if you want to draw that graphically you you put uh, the element of x um, somewhere and you draw an edge whenever two, uh, uh, two measurements are compatible. And so this gives you the list of contexts. And now you also need to specify outcomes for each observable. So that's basically the basis of your what's called a bundle diagram. And so, uh, as I said, we want to go into the CV. So the CV, you can relax X to be, as I said, infinite set of measurement levels, but you can also relax O to become um, just a, um, a continuum. And so for this, for instance, for each of observable, you can require that it's just a compact set. Um, and so in this picture, you know, what's missing is to really specify the joint, the priority for joint outcomes, right? So basically it's the basis of your experiment, but then you need to actually perform your experiment and specify what's, what's the joint outcomes. And so this is precisely what the empirical models are for. So an empirical model is a set of priority distribution for each context. It will specify the joint priority distribution whenever two uh, outcomes uh, or two measurements can be performed 
uh, jointly. And so to give you an example, uh, here is a representation of a PR box. And so um, for the bundle diagram, I don't represent the, the priorities. I just represent an edge whenever uh, I can witness a joint outcome. And you see that bundle diagrams are very helpful to uh, witness context rate because here you can see that whenever you take um, a local path, a local section, you, know, you cannot extend, extend that to a, a closed uh, path throughout the diagram. Uh, but of course, um, if you go to the CV setting and you require just um, um, a, a continuum for each outcome, then you cannot uh, picture that anymore with bundle diagrams. Okay, so now to go back, to go into more details for uh, continuous variables, we just basically extend um, as you would the object we have. So um, an empirical model now, uh, because X, so X might be an infinite set of measurements labeled, and O is just a compact set, it's a measurable space. So as you would expect, E is not a priority distribution, but it becomes a priority measure on the space of joint outcomes, OC. And you have such object like a priority measure for each uh, context. And uh, if you want, you can also uh, make sure that your uh, empirical model satisfies no disturbance, so that it belongs to this big polytope. Okay. And now we need the notion of non-contextuality, of course. And so, as I said before, with this idea of uh, being locally consistent, but globally not explainable, this is kind of this, uh, uh, this idea yeah, that you, you, you find here. But I'm defining, uh, watch out, non-contextuality, the converse. So you will say that um, something is non-contextual or extendable whenever um, you can uh, extend your um, empirical model to a global priority measure on the joint space of every measurement. Uh, so OX, this is a, a space with non-compatible measurements, right? So in the case of the um, Bell scenario, it's uh, um, the measurement for A, A prime, B, and B prime all together. So it's a uh, assignment on this. And if you can find a, a global explanation on, on, uh, on this space that allows you to retrieve the empirical prediction by marginalization, then you say that you're non-contextual. Okay, does that make sense? So this is the first notion of uh, non-classicality. Um, and so, yeah, so basically it's an extension to, to, to the CV um, realm. The other notion uh, I will be talking about is a Wigner function. So maybe you're less familiar with a Wigner function, but it's something that um, people from quantum optics have been using for a long time. Um, so a Wigner function for one particle is just a real valued function on a space on the space R2 for two particles. So basically you, you define this phase space with a position Q and momentum P, and you try to, to build what's like a, a priority distribution for this um, quadrature measurement, P and Q, and this gives you your, your Wigner function. Okay. Crucially, um, what's nice about the Wigner function and what people use the Wigner function is that when you, whenever you marginalize along a direction, it gives you the correct priority distributions for position and momentum uh, measurements. So basically for the quadrature. So you take any rotative quadrature, you're marginalized of Wigner function, and it gives you the, the correct representation for that. Um, if you're really not familiar with the Wigner function, basically you can think of it as a quantum state. So like you have an equivalence between a quantum state and Wigner function for continuous variables. However, the problem is that um, it may take negative values. So when it's non-negative, it's very nice. You can use the Wigner function as kind of your hidden variable model in some sense. So basically you can describe classically what's happening, but it may take negative value. And uh, as you can see here, and so when it takes non-negative value, uh, people from quantum optics say that it's an indicator of uh, non-classicality. So basically, people are doing like tomography to find, like to prove that their states are um, Wigner negative, and from that they say, okay, so I have some kind of uh, non-classicality going on. And this is emphasized by the fact that uh, you need Wigner negativity to have a quantum speed. So basically, this is uh, an extension of the gottsman neil theorem by uh, Marie and Isert. And it says that if you decompose your computation into steps where everything can be mapped to a positive Wigner function, uh, sorry, uh, French uh, deformation, a non-negative Wigner function, 
uh, then your, your uh, computation can be simulated classically efficiently. So like you have an operational meaning that says that if you want a quantum speed up, you need negativity somewhere. Okay. And so as you've seen, you have two notions of non-classicality for continuous variable systems that are somehow kind of similar. So for contextuality, um, it's a failure of being able to reconstruct a global, like an object, a global object, giving you your prediction. And for the Wigner function, it's kind of, okay, so we, we, we manage to, to construct certain object, like a global object, but it's not a priority distribution because it can take negative values, okay? And so the idea was for us to ask um, what's the precise relationship between those two notions of non-classicality. And this is not questions we ask out of the blue, it's because there are some precedents uh, in the literature. So you have some results that implies, uh, that, that, that shows some implication. So notably, you have a result by uh, Rob Speckens that shows that uh, generalized uh, contextuality is equivalent to the non-existence of any non-negative quasi priority distribution. There's a lot of non, so I hope you put that in the right order, but basically, um, it's, a, it's a nice result, but the drawback is that whenever you want to uh, witness contextuality, you have to go through all um, quasi priority distribution and check whether they are uh, negative or not. And, and you have a continuum of those quasi priority distributions, so it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, but you have some actual equivalence results for discrete variable systems. So uh, this is an important result by, by Mark here in 2014 and co-authors. So basically they show that for um, power of a prime, right, I'm not so mistaken, yeah, dimension, uh, you have an equivalence result between contextuality uh, seen in the hypergraph picture, but you have, I mean, you have equivalence between all those kind of representation and, and, uh, Wigner fun and uh, negativity of the Wigner function for QD system. And this result has been extended to, um, to um, out dimension and then qubit system by Nicola Delfos and co author and Rosendorf and co -author. Okay, uh, but this equivalence are for discrete variable system, as I said, and so the creation remains for continuous variables. And it's a bit, in some sense, a bit weird because uh, the Wigner function was introduced for continuous variable system uh, at first. Like it's really people from quantum optics, uh, continuous variable quantum optics are using the Wigner function. So, let me present you um, the results. So to actually prove the results, we need to be in a specific setting. So we need to specify what the measurement scenario we are considering. Um, and so the measurement scenario is as follows. So you have to specify X, M, and the set of outcomes. So X is a set of measurement labels. And for us, the set of measurement labels consists of all points in phase space. So your phase space is R to, the, to N for N particles. And whenever you have a, like you take any point, it represents a measurement uh, lab for you. And now the maximal context are just maximal subset, subset, subset of X of commuting quadrature. So each maximal context is a Lagrangian, if you want. Hello, yeah, cool. It's a Lagrangian, and so um, M is the Lagrangian Grassmannian of uh, X. So basically just set of maximal uh, um, commuting quadratures. Okay, and so, um, OX for each um, measurement label is just basically uh, R, like uh, for each quadrature, you, you may um, witness any real value. So any, any uh, real on the real line. And so whenever you consider a joint, like a, um, a set of measurement level, um, the joint outcome set is just R to the U, but because now U may be a continuum, then you can think of uh, value assignments as functions from U, uh, U to R, right? So they are a bit weirder than what you would be used to for value assignments, but basically now value assignments are just functions. Okay. And so now for the empirical models on this measurement scenario, so yeah, so basically I take empirical models on this measurement scenario. And so basically my objects are just uh, priority measures on the space or to the U, and U is the subset of uh, X, okay? And we also require that these empirical models are quantum, uh, so they verify the Born rule, and the reason is because we want to make an equivalence with the Wigner function, 
which is an object defined uh, from 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 quantum like from the quantum theory so you need empirical models to to be quantum of course and so this is a theorem so basically it says that whenever you have uh, two particles or more um, your state rho is non-contextual for the measurements uh, the measurement scenario uh, if and only if the Wigner function is so you need to assume that it's integrable and non-negative crucially so you have the equivalence results um, so it seems quite easy stated like that, but uh, you have to work a bit because it's continuous variable and whenever you con con consider a continuous system, it starts to be very uh, complicated. So we had some uh, technical uh, lemmas that we need to prove. So uh, first, also um, on your uh, measurement scenario, you could, could think of very weird uh, uh, hidden variable models. The reason I'm, so I didn't, mentioned hidden variable model because I'm lacking times, but basically you can think of uh, non-contextuality as being uh, uh, being able to find a non-contextual hidden variable model uh, that describe your 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 uh, your data basically. And so here, yeah, you could think of very weird HVM, but um, due to fine uh, Abramski and Ballenberger, you have a theorem that says that you kind of have a canonical HVM. Uh, and we also extended this result to the CV setting. So basically, you have some some native, some canonical HVM you can consider. So in our case, um, um, global value assignments are just functions from R to the X, and X is R to the 2N itself. But so here is a mismatch, because the Wigner function is not defined on R to the R to the 2N, it's defined on R to the 2N. So you have a, a mismatch, right? Um, and so we get around this uh, difficulty by showing that it's sufficient to consider linear value assignments from uh, U to R. So whenever you have a value assignment that is non-linear, you can just discard it. Uh, because basically, via the Born rule, your empirical model won't assign weight on this non-linear function. So you, you, you can restrict to uh, linear forms. And the nice thing is that now these linear forms are like it's isomorphic to X. So it uh, solves this mismatch dimension. Uh, and then um, the idea for the proof was to take the uh, Fourier transform at some point, but then you need to make sure that you can take the, the Fourier transform. So we managed to prove some results on the empirical model that uh, allow us to define a good HVM so that we can take the Fourier transform. So basically, we, we show that it, uh, it has a good density uh, in the middle theoretic approach to take the, the Fourier transform. And so these results, um, is somehow uh, important for the notions of non-classicality in two ways. So um, for the negativity of the Wigner function, it's, it's somehow important because it says now that, you know, it doesn't mean that the Wigner function is not um, the right quasi priority to, to consider because now, because of the equivalence, it says that you cannot find such a classical representation anyway. So um, any representation you could think of, I would fail at giving you a, like a, a classical representation. Um, and also, uh, as I said, from the results of Mary and Isaac, uh, you needed the negativity of the Wigner function to have a, a, a quantum speed up. So via this theorem, now it says that you also need contextuality because equivalent. So it gives kind of ground, grounding to uh, contextuality for that. And now the outlook, because uh, as was said just earlier, it's also uh, give a lot of question uh, now to, to study. Um, um, we're trying to see whether it gives um, a witness um, or better witnesses to witness contextuality in experimental settings to see whether we could derive a proper continuous variable bell inequality, uh, which is something that is not obtained yet in the literature. Um, we also try to find strong links between, between measures and non-classicality and not necessarily only qualitative links like that. We also want to have quantitative links. So for instance, you have measures of uh, uh, non-classicality in both cases. So in, in the case of finger negativity, it's a volume of negativity, for instance. And for the continuous variable contextuality, you have uh, something called the contextual fraction. So we are trying to see how is our link uh, is one monotone with respect to the other one, etc., etc. Um, and we would like to extend these methods to different measurement scenarios. And 
especially uh, approximate measurement scenarios, because as we saw, as a measurement scenario is not very uh, implementable in practice because you need to consider all phase points uh, and all points in phase space. And so you have a continuum of, of search. So, uh, yeah. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Hey, so question for Pierre. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, so to my understanding, the quadratures have Gaussian representations in the Wigner function. And so the, the quadratures are all Gaussian. Uh, if you, so you mean the um, marginalized uh, Wigner function? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or rather like the, the, um, the representation of the PVM okay, elements. Yeah. And so in some sense, all the non-classicality is pushed to the state side. And I was just curious so, if there's a way to generalize this to perhaps like a, a photon uh, number resolving measurement instead of a quadrature mm -hmm. measurement. Yeah, so I mean, it's 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 kind of tricky because yeah, it says that you need negativity somewhere, so you need to have non gaussianity somewhere, uh, at least non gaussianity somewhere, and so either it's pushed at the state, but it can also be pushed to the measurement. So, for instance, people doing uh, um, boson sampling, you could think, well, why are they doing boson sampling? Because I mean, everything is Gaussian. Well, no, because the measurement is not Gaussian because you're doing threshold detection. And so, yeah, it can come from also the detection. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe I can add to this. So am I correct in saying that this result holds for this particular setting when the measurements are yes. Other, right? Okay. Yes. So but one of the open questions is what happens in other settings. Exactly, yeah. OK. But somehow you need to relate the Wigner function. So it cannot be like some weird measurement scenario that has nothing to do with uh, how the Wigner function is constructed, basically. So the Wigner function is const constructed from quadratures, so it makes sense to... Yeah, yeah I understand that this is the more sensitive. Yeah, um, and then you have but... technical difficulties that says that if you only consider a finite uh, numbers of quadratures, you don't, you cannot reconstruct the Wigner function uniquely, and so... I, mean... I understand. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Pierre again. Yeah, so next speaker is Emmanuel. Christian. Oh, Christian, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Christian. Uh, yeah, so yeah. let's speak. Thank you. Welcome. So I come from ICFO and I will talk about a technique called broadcasting and more specifically about device independent and semi device independent uh, entanglement certification with this technique. So I'll give you like some spoilers for one minute about what the talk will be about. So then you kind of know everything, but then I'll just explain everything in more detail. So we know that we have the phenomena of entanglement and non-locality, and it's known that they're not equivalent. You can have entangled states which can never violate the Bell inequality. And this is known through the existence of something called local states, local hidden variable models for states. But there are techniques to put these states in more complex scenarios, and then you get some sort of non-locality from this. And there are several of these techniques, and broadcasting is just one more of them, but, well, I'm biased, but I would say it's better than others because of reasons, which I will explain. So this is joint work with these people. So actually, for context, I will present some work from two years ago by these three people, which, where they introduced the broadcast scenario, and they speak of activation of non-locality, and then in the continuation of this project, it's like these other people and me. <coughs> so we focused more on device independent certification and not so much on activation of non-locality. So I'll begin by reviewing the standard bell scenario, but since this is the device independent session, I guess all of you know this, but to set like the notation and the pictures. So we have these two labs, we have Alice and Bob, they're space like separated. They have a shared resource, they can choose some measurements labeled by X and Y. They get some outputs A and B. And then the correlations that, or the statistics that describe this experiment are given by a probability distribution, P of A, B given X, Y. And then this can have a, we can ask whether there's a local hidden variable model that describes it, or whether there's a quantum model that is, describes it also, or we, if you can simulate your statistics with a quantum model. And regarding the 
um, well, to explain what the notation here, pi is projective measurement, but it's not very relevant. So about the question of if for, does the pointer work? Ah, yes, it works. So if for every entangled state, there exists projective measurement such that the statistics you get from Born's rule is not local. Well, I said it in the summary, no. And why, how do we know this? So now I'll review a bit what's known or the state of the art about local hidden variable models. And I will say this um, by benchmarking or just saying what's known about a specific class of states called the Werner states, which are just a Bell state mixed with a uniform state. And then this alpha here encodes a simple notion of noise. So for alpha equal to one, you just get the Bell state. And for alpha equal to zero, you just get the uniform state. And then you have a continuous range between zero and one. So by just applying the PPT criteria, you can see that this state is separable up to uh, like below one third for this visibility. Then Werner in 89 showed that um, if you assume projective measurements, you can build the local model for up to one half. By building a local model means you can never violate the Bell inequality in this range. Then Barrett extended this to P of EMs, but with a less robust, or like you don't get up to one half, but like five to outs. And from then to now, there were many more other results which improve on these numbers. So I'll not explain how, but you get like better numbers. So now it's known that you have a local model for projective measurements up to 683 and for POVMs up to 455. So that's from one direction, from the local models. Then we can go from the other direction and just see non-locality. So with just the CHSH inequality, you get one over square root of two. And then with more complicated techniques, you get just very slightly below it, like 100, I don't know, something like this. And then there's this gap where no one knows what happens between 683 and 697. Um, OK, so this is the standard scenario. It's like the previous picture with Alice and Bob. But people improved on this and thought of diff different scenarios. And they define an appropriate notion of non-locality. And then you, get, you can get for some local, for some regime, for some uh, some point along this curve, you can you can find the locality. Yes, so uh, we call this activation activation of non-locality. So one technique it's hidden non-locality. This was from Popescu. So the idea is that before Alice and Bob do their measurements, they apply a filter filtering operation, and then conditioned on the basically it's a previous measurement but with no inputs, and conditioned on the result of this of this previous measurement, they choose their setting. And with this, they can get non-locality. And then people also improved on this. And now you can you have these sequential scenarios where you have many rounds of measurements. But it's not shown, or there's no example where doing these sequential things is better than just this. But still a nice generalization. And um, the other class of techniques is the multiple copy scenarios, where you um, just take many copies of your state, and then by putting them either in a network, uh, but not in the sense of network non-locality. It's a network, but more like just multi-partite standard Bell non-locality. Or if you just do, do the put them in parallel, then you can um, you can get non-locality. Which makes sense because by having several copies of the state, you're kind of introducing more entanglement in the system, which you can exploit. So now I'm going back to this, to this, um, I don't know what to call it. It's not a plot, it's like this axis. Uh, okay, so superactivation is what's, uh, it's the parallel copies. So with this, you can saturate the whole range of entanglement. For this class of states, it doesn't hold for all states. But for the Werner states, it's true that you can saturate the range of entanglement. 
and hidden or locality it doesn't give you any any advantage for the state it's not on the graph because you get no activation with it it's what i say in red okay so now that i've given you a bit the background i've given you a benchmark to compare techniques so now i will introduce the idea of broadcasting ah yeah i forgot to say this so when you when you get close as you get closer and closer to one third, the number of copies you need with the parallel copies technique goes to infinity. And you also need entangling measurements. So it's nice as a theoretical tool to show no locality, but you can never implement this. So what's broadcasting all about? So in the standard belt scenario, before doing your measurements, you can always apply any local transformation or operation that you want, and then you do the measurements. So the idea with broadcasting would be, um, so what I said would be this, like this box would be anything that you want to do, and then you do the measurement. But the idea with broadcasting is that you apply or you do anything that you want, but now you will split your system into two and you'll share it to two of your friends that are locally space-like separated which is this. So you can imagine that, well, I used Bob for this, but let's imagine there's a parent Bob that sends it to his friend who's also called Bob and the other one is called Charlie. Well, the point is you split the system. That's the main, the main idea. And this is, so I guess you'll see where I'm going, you see where I went with this. This will give activation, but I want to just emphasize that it's quite surprising. Because when you have these local models, you cannot violate tabel inequality in any scenario. It's not for a specific number of settings or number of inputs and outputs. Like if I go to a thousand outputs and a thousand inputs in the standard bell scenario, I will still never violate tabel inequality. But now here I'm like increasing the number of inputs and outputs, but now I'm just reinterpreting them as different parties. So it's kind of like going from two and two to four and four. And then you do a so have zero one two three. You have zero 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 one one zero one one, and then you reinterpret it as two parties, and then you impose that they cannot communicate. And with this, it's a strong enough constraint that you can get strongly non-classical behavior. And formally, how do I write this? So it's kind of like standard band locality, but here for uh, Bob and Charlie. Well, so. People in the back might not see this line, but well, it's the definition of, so you should try to see it. <laughs> uh, so the key thing is that if I don't impose that this local term is no signaling between Bob and Charlie, I can always just join Bob and Charlie together into a single party. So it's important to note that this has a constraint that this term is no signaling. And I didn't define no signaling. I hope it's clear to everyone it, what it is. It means that when you marginalize over one party, it doesn't depend on the setting of the other party. So actually, you can test this with a linear program. So it's quite efficient. It's nice. And then, ah, yeah. I added this just now. Mm. It doesn't fit with the narrative. Well, <laughs> so uh, I'll go back to this. So. You do the linear programming, and then you get a polytope. And then this polytope has facets. And then um, some of them, you can write them nicely, analytically. And then you, um, to show activation, you just find an example of a, of a quantum state, which is outside the set. And then you study its uh, noise robustness. So one example of a quantum violation, um, Alice has three inputs. They're all the poly matrices. Three, input, three measurements, and they're just the uh, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Then Charlie also has two of those, but then Bob has something that's not nice. It's just some weird angle. So it's like not a, it's clean, but not super clean. I don't know if that makes sense. And then the channel is the one that maps the, the bell state to the JZ state. So this is quite nice. And then with this, this previous inequality, the one above, um, you get the local bound is, well, the broadcast local bound is four, 
then we get four square root of three. So then the visibility is one over square root of three. And this is um, below this 683. Actually, numerically, you can go slightly below the 577. OK, so this is the result like from two years ago on broadcasting and how you can show non locality with it. So now I just also wanted to write this with a, in, a, in the language of Bayesian directed acyclic graphs. So you can write this like this, and then you would write that you have like a non signaling resource between Bob and Charlie. But then you can also rewrite this like this. So if anyone wants to do this, it's, it's here. So the way to reason this, well, yeah, it's Mark Olivier's idea. Uh, so the way to interpret what it means for a local kilian variable to point to this non-signaling resource is that you can imagine that Bob and Charlie can have like infinite of these boxes, and they can just receive lambda, which tells them which one to use, because they both have the same lambda. So you can. So for me, this would be an example of activation with a, with a causal network. But this is maybe controversial. So I don't know. OK. So yes, I have time. Um, OK, so this is the result from two years ago. What did we add to this? Um, OK, so one thing that we added is also an example for a different class of states, not the Werner states, because here you see that this 559 is still not below 455. So it's not an example of activation for a state with a local model for all possible measurements. But for a different class of states, we do have an example where with broadcasting, you can get activation of QVM local states. And I, I think that the main result concerns uh, device and dependent entanglement certification. So the key idea here is that before we cared about non-locality, I'm trying to show one-to-one -one correspondence between entanglement and non-locality. But now we don't care so much about non-locality. We only care about certifying entanglement. So how does it work in the standard scenario? Well, with this, we also can assume quantum mechanics. And then if you have a separable state and then you do the measurements, you'll see that the, that the correlations are local. And ah, yes. So OK, we don't care about non-locality, but clearly, if you see non-local behavior, that implies your state is entangled. So this bound of 556 uh, or 559 is a device independent certification of entanglement, but we want to improve on that. So how can we do this? So the way to do it is to go to the symmetric scenario. We explored just the one side broadcasting and it doesn't give it doesn't get better than the 559 or 556. But you go to the symmetric scenario and then you do the same. You assume that the state is separable and then you get this decomposition. So now what we would like is a way to test. Also, this is like very low. I assume people don't see this, but well, it's not super important. What's more important is the conceptual part. So we'd like to test if the probability distribution has a decomposition in this, in this form. But this is quite complicated to do because it's non-convex. But what we can do is, instead of testing if the correlations come from measuring a state which is separable, we can relax to testing if the correlations come from a state which is positive under partial transpose. If they do not come from such a state, then it must be from a state that is not PPT. And therefore, you know that the state must be entangled. That's the main idea. And then how do you do this? It's also difficult to characterize this set, but you can give a series of outer approximations in a series of a, a semi-definite program. And then if you do this, you get that you can certify entanglement almost down to one third, 
which almost saturates the whole range of entanglement. But you see that it's not exactly one third, it's slightly above it. So from this SDP technique, you do get a certificate, an analytical certificate uh, showing this, but it's not very pretty. It's quite just a numerical certificate. So we try to find, so if you remember the other inequality that gave the one over square root of three was quite nice and it was quite short and you could write it on paper, but we weren't able to do something similar for this one. So we couldn't make it nice. Um, going back to the previous um, axis. So before with my locality, we got these bounds. And then when we do this uh, PPT thing, then we get close to one third. And uh, to get like 0 0.338 with super activation, you need like 2,500 copies and entangling measurements. But with broadcasting, you only need one copy. And then you do local measurements on the states that you receive. And you need to apply two channels, but that's easier than the other. And I remember, I remind you that with sequential measurements, you don't get any sort of uh, activation or entanglement certification. And so you get these series of outer approximations and the tight or the So the, um, the higher you go in this hierarchy, the better results you get. So we didn't get to a point where there was a plateau and then it just stops at 338. It was more a question of running out of computational resources. So it kept improving and it kept getting closer and closer to one third, but we just had to stop somewhere. So it's possible that if you had a strong enough computer and you do this, you get event as close as you want to one third, maybe, I don't know. And so this slide is only to re-emphasize again the difference between activation and device-independent entanglement certification. So with activation, we care about uh, non-locality, which would be, for example, this polytope, this outer box. But with device-independent certification, we have the extra power that we assume quantum mechanics. So actually, the set that we have is tighter, it's smaller. So you see that if you have a point outside, then the visibility that you get will be better if you assume uh, the quant that you're in using quantum mechanics. But this set was difficult to characterize, so then we used this outer approximation, which is uh, an approximation of QPPT with this bipartition. And then we also have semi-device independent certification of entanglement, but it's kind of more of the same, but it's for steering. So if you're interested, you can just look at the paper. And then for as an outlook, well, it would be nice to have a nice inequality, which actually goes to one third and not close to it. It would also be nice, but this is ambitious to show that with broadcasting, you can get a one-to-one -one correspondence between entanglement and locality. And something that I think it's a nice idea is to, for well, the channel that I presented uh, maps, um, the Bell state to a JZ state, which is not so easy to implement. So it would be nice to study this scenario where you restrict yourself to the class of easy measurements and easy channels that you can actually implement in a laboratory and see if it's somehow generic that you get an improvement in whatever task, for example, entanglement certification. This might actually be useful to people. So it would be nice to show this. And that's it. Question for Christian. I have several questions actually. So, um, in a realistic experiment, how you would would you ensure that the you have non-signaling conditions between Bob and Charlie? Thank you. Well, I'm not an experimentalist. I would say have them be far away, but uh, probably that's not realistic. No, it needs to. It's the same loophole with. Um, and so, so the re relaxation you have, it's like Lasser hierarchy type relaxation, or I mean NPA hierarchy? Yes. Okay. It's called a, so there's a paper by Moroder and other people 
where they do a modification of NPA, where they take the PPT constraint on the state and translate it as a sort of PPT constraint on the moment matrix. And is there any hope to a finite convergence? Finite convergence, I don't know. Yes, this I know, but I don't know about Moroder and probably NPA is more generic. So probably that if it holds for NPA, probably there's also a case with Moroder where you might have finite convergence. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. So just a simple question, just I think I might have missed it. So why exactly do you want to allow Bob and Charlie to share a non-signaling resource? Like, are you allowing them to share peer boxes or something like this? Yes, so the reason would be that we allow complete freedom in the channel that they can, or transformation that they can apply before doing the splitting. So assume this channel just ignores the quantum state you're interested in and creates a bell state between Bob and Charlie. Then if you impose that they have a local model, then you will get a trivial non-locality but it doesn't allow you to infer that the original state is entangled. Yep. Okay. So you just allow them to have any physical correlation that they can have. Okay, and so you allow non-signaling because you want to do this device independent. Yes. And, the okay. and is there any relation between like the bounds you get and I don't know, like the, the notions of genuine multi-part type non-locality because there they have this notion where um, you, you look at the bipartitions and you say, local but then in each bipart or each partition they have non-signaling resources so it's yes, kind of like so broadcasting is a subset of that okay the genuine of the part that, well what you mentioned mm -hmm. is symmetric no yeah, yeah yeah sure and this is just one way okay but being one way allows us to make conclusions about the state we we we're interested in okay and that's interesting because that's the state which has a local model in the standard scenario and we want to get this activation out. Okay, thank you. Okay, there are a couple of questions on the Q and A. There's a Zoom thing going on right now. I didn't know. Um, this is from uh, Kian Lauk. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I have two questions. The first is for the device independent entanglement certification with only applying a broadcasting on one side. What was the best visibility you could obtain? For, um, I think it was one over square root of three and the uh, five, five, six is actually uh, symmetric. So it's a slight improvement, but it's not one side only. So one side only would be one over square root of three, numerically slightly below it, but basically one over square root of three. Okay. And the second question is, do you have any physical intuition as to why this broadcasting channel allows you to achieve this activation? No, but it's not, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not um, the, what's the name? The cloning channel. That's maybe the first intuition. Well, no, maybe there is an intuition. So, um, So when you apply this broad, let me think how to say this succinctly. So if you think of the Bell inequality, you can look at its value when you have on the state or on the correlations you get from the state when it's the Bell state. And let's say you get one value like four square root of three. And then usually on the uniform state, it might have a value, a score of zero. But when you do the broadcasting, this uniform state gets mapped closer to the edge of the polytope and this leads to better visibilities so in this sense the broadcast channel improves the score of the bell inequality on the local on the local correlation bring it closer to the edge so then you get this better threshold i don't know if that's well i hope yeah okay good it's time to thank christian again and move to your next speaker Okay, great. So next speaker is Kieran. He's going to talk about some contextual advantage. Okay, thank you uh, all for coming to the final session of the this day, this rainy day, and uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me headline this uh, beautiful second day in uh, the Batumi. So uh, this is the um, work that I did with my 
collaborators in South Korea, that's uh, Hanul Lee and Junu Bae. And also my collaborators in Denmark, uh, Carlos and Jonathan Bulbrask. So uh, I'll start by summarizing the um, key, key points of this work. So if we, as we all know, if we want to say that there's some quantum advantage to in some uh, um, information processing task, then we need to take a notion of non-classicality and derive an inequality saying that uh, uh, this non-classical theory is unable to recreate the same predictions as quantum theories. So the canonical example of this would be a violation of the CHSH inequality. However, this inequality is only valid for uh, bipartite or multipartite systems. Therefore, we, uh, for the um, situations in which we're looking at a single system, we have to look at non-contextuality. And uh, it was recently shown that uh, minimum error state discrimination is the, which is probably the simplest quantum information processing task you can think of as a contextual advantage associated with it. So in this work, what we've done is to show that this advantage is ubiquitous across uh, various kinds of state discrimination. So both the more famous uh, unambiguous state discrimination and also maximum confidence measurements, which are a generalization, uh, you can say, of unambiguous state discrimination. So uh, this talk will focus on uh, the <coughs> contextual advantages associated with um, maximum confidence measurements in a scenario in which there is semi-device uh, independent certification. And uh, this has further co consequences for more general uh, certified quantum information tasks such as randomness generation. So I'll start by uh, introducing the notion of non-contextuality, which is uh, from Rob Speckens. So this is defined in terms of these ontological models. So you have some, uh, oh, you can't see my cursor, but you have some uh, measuring device and uh, some uh, preparation device as well. And you want to model these using this uh, ontic state space formalism. So this is uh, some space in which each point completely characterizes the physical properties of your system. And uh, then the uh, operations you can perform in a lab are uh, mathematical functions on this space. So the epistemic state represents preparations, and this is a probability distribution over the ontic state space. And measurements are represented by a set of objects called the response function. Now these uh, all positive and come in sets which sum to one over the relevant region of the space. Then probabilities are calculated in this model using the uh, integral of the overlap of the two um, functions. Now it's also useful in this model to define uh, what's called the confusability. So if you have uh, two preparations, uh, here mu a and mu b, then the integral over the overlap of the two functions uh, is called a confusability. And this is uh, completely equivalent to the uh, square of the overlap of two quantum states, which we are uh, more familiar with from Hilbert space representation. Uh, okay, so now we're in a position in which we can define non-contextual and contextual theories. So the definition here of uh, preparation non-contextuality is that a theory is preparation non-contextual if it re represents operationally equivalent preparations with the same epistemic state. So as one example here, we can um, look at different preparations of the maximally mixed state. So either probabilistically preparing uh, state zero or one, or alternatively uh, doing the same with the states plus and minus. And so, as we all know, in quantum theory, these have the same um, representation, the i over two. So what this is saying is that in a non-contextual theory, we can always represent these by the same epistemic states. However, if you try to do the same thing for, um, for uh, these things in a contextual theory, it turns out that it's, it's not possible. So in particular, the supports of these epistemic states uh, that is the region on which they're defined will be different and uh, this in turn constrains the various objects such as the epistemic states and response functions which can be defined in your task so 
um, I guess everyone is familiar with minimum error state discrimination, but just to um, just to remind people here, so this is some task in which you have two states are being um, prepared with some probabilities. So, or you can have a more general ensemble, uh, and we're focusing here on the equiprobable case. So, um, then you want to perform a measurement which tells you which state was was prepared and. Here you have one POVM element associated with each possible preparation. Then you aim to maximize this uh, figure of merit, the uh, you know the probability that you find pi naught given psi naught, and uh, the probability that you find pi one given psi one, and then the maximum value you find here is the uh, Hellstrom bet. But I'd just like to make the co comment, which will be relevant later, which is that um, the Bayesian confidence we have here associated with this uh, um, Hellstrom bound is uh, less than one. So that if we get the outcome pi naught, we do not know for sure that psi naught was sent and uh, similar for pi one. Um, so in this minimum error state discrimination task, it was shown by Schmidt and Speckens that um, a non-contextual theory is unable to recreate the predictions of quantum theory. So they find this uh, linear function here in purple. Um, so what this is saying is that even in the, the simplest possible information processing task you can uh, conceive of, there's still some uh, aspect of non-classicality occurring. So uh, this leads to a number of obvious questions. So uh, first, does it apply to more general forms of state discrimination, i.e. unambiguous state discrimination and uh, maximum confidence measurements? And then there's also questions about, does this uh, um, persist in uh, uh, technologically useful or viable tasks? So if you have some um, more complicated quantum information process, then one piece of this will be minimum error state discrimination or any other form of state discrimination, but you have more complex actions happening. And then there's, uh, you can conceive that this advantage is uh, suppressed in such a case. So uh, in the work, we answered all of these uh, questions, but uh, seeing as this is the semi-device independent session or the device independent session, um, we will I'll focus here on this semi-device independent uh, certification of maximum confidence measurements. So the maximum confidence uh, discrimination scenario is this. Um, you introduce this um, third outcome, which is inconclusive, and then uh, you associate a confidence with each of your uh, remaining uh, measurement outcomes. So just calculated uh, according to Bayes' rule. And then you want to say that you want to maximize this confidence for each state in your ensemble. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is just the general formula. So in, if you have this, uh, two states, uh, two pure states in a qubit space, then you'll go back to unambiguous state discrimination. So in this case, you can, uh, 100% of the time in which you do not get the inconclusive outcome, you will know which uh, state was sent for sure. But in general, unambiguous state discrimination is not possible. So. If you have more than two states in a uh, more than two pure states, sorry, in a um, qubit space, then you can't perform unambiguous discrimination. Uh, and also, if you've got mixed states in your qubit space, it's not possible. So this has more general applications uh, uh, than uh, unambiguous state discrimination. So it's a generalization. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, you can. It has various applications, such as uh, you can um, change your. You can choose some error rate, inconclusive error rate that you are comfortable with, and uh, tailor your state discrimination process to that task. Um, okay, so what we're specifically looking at here is the certified maximum confidence scenario. So what what what's meant by uh, semi-device independent certification here is that you have 
uh, some device which you made yourself, which is preparing this date. So you trust this in particular, you trust that uh, it's giving the correct value for the overlap of the states in which you wish to prepare. And then you also have your preparation device, which you do not trust. But of course, what you do know is the uh, relative probabilities of various outcomes which come out of this device. So uh, this is considered a more realistic scenario for uh, experiments and quantum communications and so on. Then you have two questions here. You want to know, um, is this doing something quantum? And also, in general, what is the maximum confidence you can have in such a uh, device? Uh, so these are our, um, this is the main result of this uh, aspect of the work. So uh, what we do here is we say our um, uh, outcome rate associated with one particular state. Uh, we focus here on uh, pi one, but uh, of course this will change depending on which state is being looked at. And then we we say this is this error this outcome rate is fixed, and uh, then we want to maximize the confidence which we can have in both the quantum and the non-contextual case. So in general for Doing this in the quantum case, calculating the uh, maximum confidence is uh, not straightforward to do in an STP because the uh, Bayesian uh, confidence here is a nonlinear function, but the uh, SDI scenario linearizes the confidence, and therefore we are able to uh, construct an STP to do this. Um, and then for the non contextual theory, we have these. Uh, constraints on the measurement space provided by the uh, the definition. So we can do this by hand. Uh, and so what you see here is this uh, p uh, sort of the piecewise uh, behavior of the function. So in this low region, you have uh, this low outcome region, you have unambiguous state discrimination. So um, by definition, obviously, the confidence will be the same for both scenarios. However, um, we show elsewhere in the paper that there is a, um, a separate advantage associated with this inconclusive outcome rate. And so there is also a contextual advantage here, but it doesn't appear in the confidence. Then in this uh, middle region, we have this uh, uh, trade, this uh, hallmark of contextual advantages. So the uh, non-contextual theory is unable to recreate the quantum statistics. And if you go to too high an outcome rate, then uh, everything's lost and the uh, quantum mechanics and uh, non-contextual theories are the same. So, uh, okay, that's the main result of this paper or of this piece of the paper, but there's, we also have a follow-up work here, which I, um, I don't have the time to talk about, but I want to advertise, which is showing that in a, a really practical scenario of randomness generation for, um, which can be done using state discrimination. Uh, we we were also able to show that there are some uh, quantum advantages. So this is uh, really something which is practical and uh, can be used in uh, technology and uh, the same results apply. Okay, so to summarize, we took uh, non-contextuality as our notion of classicality and then showed some quantum advantages. And uh, this holds particularly in the the feasible scenario in which the devices are semi-independent and uh, also for some useful tasks such as randomness generation. Thank you. Great, question for Kieran. Okay, I'm gonna ask one. Okay. Uh, not there, are others? Okay. okay, I'm gonna start and the chair, I decide who starts. Um, yeah, so I realized, I saw that in the case of minimum um, error discrimination, yes. the difference non contextual quantum is linear versus quadratic. Yes. While in your case, it's, uh, you know, a bit more uh, complex, right? Yeah. Regions that there, are, there is no advantage. Yeah. And uh, in the other case, like uh, the non contextual scenarios, I don't know, also to prove it, like, uh, is it like, um, did you run some numerics or is it still No, so, so, the, so this... Uh... You're talking about uh, yes. this, this result, right? So, um, the no, the non-contextual case here was uh, calculated analytically. So, 
uh, this actually this piecewise structure really comes because you're fixing the outcome rate for some measurement and then um, if you have some ensemble right you have a minimum and a maximum eigenvalue and so if you have some projective measurement you can't go outside of this region so you have to start doing some uh, classical uh, probabilistic uh, um, relabeling and so on in order to get this so I think this is really the, re the reason why there's uh, high and uh, low low cases there's uh, nothing happening oh. so this this central region is when the the uh, for both cases the optimal measurement is sharp so i think there's maybe there's some significance in the fact you have this sharp measurement is required to demonstrate a quantum advantage and then i guess the concavity just comes because it's the the confidence and it's bayesian and uh, so you've got some fraction and uh, so on and so forth Okay, that thanks. would be my speculation. Okay. Perfect. So you're telling me I ask a smart question, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there was kind of two things about this. One, do you have a nice parameterization of like the optimal quantum strategy? I mean, you said you used... In the... In the, in the uh, for this plot here. Um, so... Yeah, we, we used SDPs to do this. I, don't, I think this, uh, we don't have a good understanding of how the structure okay. of these maximum confidence uh, measurements uh, occur. Okay. I mean, uh, in the um, other cases, there's some nice geometric interpretations and so on, but I think that's yeah. lacking for the, the maximum confidence okay. scenarios. At the moment. And for the non-contextual part, you said you did it by hand, but was it easy to kind of really show that you find the optimal thing by hand? Because like in the... And the minimum error one, I mean, they take the polytopes, right? And they yes, do this, yes. like, I mean, it's, it's kind of methodological, but it's not so trivial in here, it seems. I would have so, thought it's more complicated, but can yes, you say a bit more about that? Yeah, so, I mean, we can, we, the, the, the point is that the non-contextuality uh, constrains the space of the, the response functions, right? And so, um, we, we know, um, I mean, it, in the unambiguous case, for example, you know that you need a response function which is uh, has zero overlap with the uh, with the other thing. So, by anal analogy with quantum mechanics, you can construct this, and then um, and then uh, using this kind of uh, uh, um, intuition, you can construct some a set of response functions, and then you show that they're they're optimal. Okay. It, it is possible, yeah. Okay. I, I, I think it's uh, possible to do in the the uh, minimum error case as well. So I, I looked before and in the the Schmidt and Speckens case. So while you can um, you can recreate their uh, optimal value for the non-contextual case by uh, the measurement that you have to perform is you perform a, a probabilistic measure uh, with fifty percent probability you measure in the uh, uh, Say sine naught, uh, sine naught orthogonal basis, and then uh, and then fifty percent in the other basis. So uh, I think you can actually constrain the response function space more than uh, has been discussed before. Okay, thank you. Okay, you, you got another question. Can you explain how you use that to generate randomness, or I mean, comment a bit on? Uh... Um, Yes, well, I can give the uh, a quick summary of uh, the, the way it works is that the um, the if you have the inconclusive error rate, if you have the inconclusive outcome, you assign a bit value of zero, and if you have an uh, if you have a conclusive outcome, you assign a bit value of one, and and so on and so forth. So in this way, you can use uh, it's shown before that you can certify uh, unambiguous state discrimination derived randomness, and then we we take the same approach here. Okay, so this was the last talk. Let's thank Kieran again. <laughs>